Excellency Dr. Srinivasa and Mrs. Ashwini Srinivasa, Vice President Kemraj Ramjatan, Vice President Sidney Adikok, Minister Kati Hughes, Minister Ronald Bulkan, Minister Dr. George Norton, former President Samuel Hines, Sa former President Donald Ramutar, former First Lady, former First Lady, yes, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dr. Pollard, Ambassador visiting from India, Guyana High School Commissioner, other dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are here to celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of the great Mohandas Karamchan Gandhi, fondly referred to as the Mahatma as Bapuji. I agree with the representative of the leader of the opposition that it is not a day to deal with illegalities and constitutionalities, but these were the matters that were addressed primarily in the lifetime of Gandhiji. And as we saw in the depiction of the illegal and unlawful expulsion from the train, he fought that as an illegality. He fought that as a violation of his constitutional right as a human being, as a person of color, but who should not have been treated differently. So we must not separate at any time the great Mahatma from politics and from ideologies and from philosophies. He is and has been all things to all men and all women. We have all learned something. Our Guruji, Yesu Pasad, he referred to his own life after the tenets of Gandhiji, a philanthropist. Gandhi was unique in trying to blend economics with ethics. He tried to demonstrate that the rich was holding the wealth of the world for the poor. Many say that he's an idolist. He was an idolist to believe that the rich, the rich imperial powers, the Zamindaris and the Kulaks in other countries were in fact going to give up their wealth one day to the poor. But it was a good notion. But there were, and there have been since then, philanthropists, people who share their wealth with those who are less fortunate. And Dr. Yesu Pasad is an example of that, who creates centers of learning from his own funds and became, have become exemplars, like others we know, Bill Gates and others, trying to give back some of their wealth to the world. So the teaching of Mahatma Gandhi on this aspect was not lost. But what was important was the way he derived his theories that shows the all-inclusivity of the man, the all-integrated personality that was Mahatma Gandhi. He learned from the Bible. He was adept at trying to understand the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount and what it meant when he said, that it was easier for an elephant to walk through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ had said that. And he was admonishing the world. He was speaking to power, to the imperial power, using the words of Jesus Christ. That wealth will take you nowhere. And that you should learn to distribute your wealth to those who do not have. But also, from all readings, Gandhiji was just not a lawyer who was educated in England and went into South Africa and had a bad experience in a train and he decided to fight for people in South Africa. Gandhi was more purposeful. He had analyzed great theories of great revolutionaries and thinkers of the world. And I think this is on a day such as this, when we are celebrating his life, we must also celebrate his intellect. He was not just as Brit as the British Prime Minister Churchill had said, a naked fakir walking around half naked with a piece of stick in his hand. He was a person of intellect, profound intellect. My reading of Gandhi, because I came out of a period in my life, the year in the became independence. I may think I was one of those independence children. And many years after, as we grew up, we learned from the lessons of India. And we learned, as I entered politics in 1961, India was one of the countries, its freedom struggles, that had influenced me immensely. And we walked in the road with the Indian flag and we sing Jai Hin, Jai Hin, Janamana Gana, and we were there as little boys and girls in the streets. We didn't come by theories then, but Gandhi did. Gandhi analyzed the methods of struggle of V.I. Lenin of Russia. He studied this Russian Revolution very well. He understood the theories of economics of Bentham. He understood the philosophy of dialectics of Hegel and Kant. He understood all the teachings, well, he said modestly, he could never understand all the teachings because teachings have been old and there long before him. So who was he to know anything else that people before him had not known? That was his modesty in accepting the, the epitome of an intellect. But he blended matter, the science of matter and dialectics with the science of spirituality. He blended it with ethics, and he knows that a corrupt politician was unlikely to enter into the kingdom of God, just as the rich man was. And he decided to preach morality. He decided to confront naked, brutal power with the force of morality and spirituality. And that is where the source of his satragraha came from. To be able to use non-violence as a means to shock the indifference of the world. Dr. Yasu Prasad referred to the Amritsar massacre and which was, as we saw in the movie Gandhi, scores of Indian protesters peacefully dressed in white, were making their marches and they were beaten one after the other. The reporter, I think his name was Walker, reporting to the BBC, is that the beating took place all day and all night. And scores and scores of men were pulled away by their women who were dressing their wounds, but they never resisted the brutality 
of those who acted under imperial order. Gandhi shocked the sensibilities of the world, not by fighting back, not by resisting. Of course, resistance was of a different form, but not violently confronting the enemy. The world saw the brutality of the enemy, and the world was awakened to the fact that India had deserved independence, not the violence, not to live continuously and always under the crushing heels of the greedy imperial power that Britain was, who had seen India as the jewel in the crown of the British Raj. Not as a country of people, but as a jewel to be exploited and to be plucked out to feed the industrial greed of Britain at that time of the Industrial Revolution. So Gandhi made war without violence. In my time, those who know me knew I was committed to extra parliamentary forms of struggle because what I had seen in my time of struggle, I felt needed a response of a certain type. But it didn't mean that that was the first resort. Gandhi referred to the Quran and he recognized the fact that the Quran says that violence should be prevented at all costs and permitted only when necessary. I wish those who today are resorting to acts of terrorism and violence in the name of the Quran, they would understand that there was a master in the practice of nonviolence who would gain inspiration from the teaching of the Quran as he did from the Bible, as I said, as he did from the Bhagavad Gita, as he did from sources of Jainism, Buddhism, from all sources of wisdom. He drew the power of his knowledge and he applied it. He had the courage to apply it in principle, in practice. So we are celebrating the life of someone who has been extraordinary who had shown that he preferred to live the life of the common person who was without clothing, who paid back the British with their own obsession to make money and more money and profits and more profits by rejecting the cloth that was produced in India that was resold to India as fabric and which formed a great part of his movement, the Satragaha movement, to show that you could tell, send a message to your oppressor that you didn't have to wear their clothes, for which they pay piffle to those who made the cloth in the first place in India. And he starved the cotton factories in Lancashire and elsewhere. That is why when he went there to England, he went first to the cotton workers the cloth workers in Lancashire, and they believed that he had a message, a moral message that British workers should not help in the exploitation of Indian poor workers. So we have learned in the years of Gandhiji's life and teaching tremendous lessons that would guide us, those of us particularly who are in government, those of us who are involved in the art of governance, that we should always be above questioning. And we should never be afraid to lift our hands and say the hands are clean. Because that's the moral message. We cannot just come here and celebrate Gandhi's life and not acknowledge the fact that here are some truism that we can benefit from and we can live by. Corruption 
is one of those things, as we know, had succeeded the Handiji, even in the land of his birth. Governments were removed and governments were replaced because of that. Because they did not adhere to some of those precepts, moral precepts, the ethical values that one follows in public life. And so today, if I stand here and I speak as I do without notes or having to read, is because Gandhiji had touched my own life. Might not have been committed to as others did. Subhas Chandra Bose wasn't convinced by Gandhiji's nonviolent method. I read also that Arvindo Ghosh, he was not convinced. There were many leaders, even at one time, the great Jawaharlal Nehru, with hot youth blood, felt the way to oust the British was to do so violently. So it wasn't a method that was universally accepted, but it was a method that had great persuasion that you could reject Gandhi's mes message, but you couldn't reject the repercussions of what can happen if you didn't. Because he always believed that the, those who perpetrate violence, he referred to them as the destroyers. That the destroyers love when you wage war against them. Because they like to claim victories. And the way they claim victories is by suppression, killing, and destruction. So the destroyer has one mission. But those of the poor who have to survive to inherit the earth. They have to live to inherit the earth. And that is why he referred to the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. The poor have a reason to live, not the rich. They will neither go into heaven, nor enjoy their conquest forever. After Gandhiji died, the colonial empire crumbled. Not only the British colonial empire, the Italian colonial empire, the French colonial empire, the Italian uh, uh, colonial power, the Belgian colonial power. Colonialism had become the target of the peoples of the world, the poor peoples of the world, and they rose up in justifiably righteous resistance to foreign oppressors. So, yes, Bande Mataram is not a phenomenon of India of bowing to motherland. Bande Mataram was the slogan given to the world that each nation should bow to their own motherland, their own country, their own flag, their own constitution, their own government. Because if you don't, you would not expect the respect of others, nor the sympathy of those who would oppress you. So today, I bow to Gandhiji for his wisdom, his knowledge, his example of struggles uncompromisingly, and this he bequeathed, bequeathed to the world as his legacy. We are fortunate that we could sit under this big tent today and we could reflect on the life of an extraordinary person, of an extraordinary human being, a human being who had exa been exalted in his death and his lifetime as a Mahatma, a great soul. And so it is a pleasure that I identify with today's event. Thank you, High Commissioner. Thank you, Madam High Commissioner, for having me here and allowing me to say these words. Namaste.